Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's been a while and while I've been gone, a few things have changed. One of those things is that I cut off about 14 inches of my hair and one of the other things is I got a cat. <laughs> This is Emma. She's a Russian blue kitten. We've had her since the beginning of October and she is just the cutest wee thing that I've ever had and she's so beautiful and lovely but she definitely wants down now. As you all know I'm a huge fan of ancient Egypt and we all know that they are the original. So when we decided that we were going to get a cat I originally wanted to give her an ancient Egyptian name and thusly did a, a ton of research to find one that I liked. We ended up going with something a little different, which I will explain at the end of this video, but I found out so much cool information about the relationship between ancient Egyptians and their cats. I wanted to make a video to share it with you guys. Before we get into things, don't forget to subscribe my channel to help show your support. And if you're so inclined, go give me a follow on Instagram at rachelalman.digs for more archaeology content and now the addition of cat content. <laughs> okay guys, let's dig in. The domestication of cats happened quite a long time ago and was something that happened as a result of the invention and widespread use of agriculture. The large stores of food that come from agriculture like grains or barley would inevitably attract rodents like rats and mice who were soon followed by one of their natural predators wild cat. Early farmers quickly realized that this could be a mutually beneficial relationship when cats were t helping them control their rodent problems and so started leaving out food to attract cats to their settlements and thus our relationship with them was born and cats were domesticated. Now there are two main breeds of cats that are native to Egypt, the African wild cat and the jungle cat. As Egypt was a primarily agrarian or agricultural society at that time, it's entirely possible that Egyptian farmers had the same conclusions about cats as their neighbors who domesticated them first in the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia and attracted cats that way. It's also possible that they came via trade routes because obviously if you're transporting food and other goods you have similar problems to if you're just storing them in one place. Like their neighbors, Egyptians admire cats for their hunting and protective abilities, especially when it came to killing venomous creatures like scorpions and snakes, but then they took it to the next level by giving cats a basically semi-divine status in their religion and society. Tomb paintings, statues, and jewelry all show Egyptians fondness for their cats. The earliest known cat goddess in Egypt is Moftet, who appears around 5,000 years ago during the first dynasty of Egypt. She was often depicted as a cheetah and she was the deification of justice or also known as Ma'at. Her name rather appropriately translates to the runner which was a indicative of her like celestial role of ripping out the hearts of enemies and then delivering them to the feet of Pharaoh. She was associated with the protection of the king's chambers and other sacred places as well as being a protector against venomous animals like snakes or scorpions who were seen as transgressors against Ma'at. While she appears in the first dynasty it seems like like her worship was most popular during the reign of the pharaoh Den. In his tomb we have found mentions of her on stone vessel fragments and also she is mentioned in a dedicatory entry on the Palermo stone. References to the more widely known cat goddess Bast or Bastet start to appear in the second dynasty. Her cult center was a town called Bubastis located in the Nile Delta region. Originally she was depicted as a fierce warrior lioness goddess which is a similar role shared by another goddess called Sekhmet. As time went on Bast and Sekhmet actually merged and became two distinct aspects of the wider goddess Hathor with Lioness Sekhmet representing the warrior protector goddess and Bast now depicted as a cat and seen as a goddess of motherhood and childbirth probably as a result of the fertility of the domestic cat. She was also seen as a protector against evil and disease in more of the traditional role of a cat. It was quite popular for people to wear 
cat amulets to invoke Bast's blessing. And there were temples dedicated to her throughout all of Egypt, all of which would house and care for a huge amount of cats. There's actually a myth from Bubastis that turquoise is the fallen menstrual blood of Bast, which was transformed as soon as it touched the ground. There are uh, several other lesser known cat deities as well. Uh, one of the favorite ones that I found was Pakhet. Her name literally translates to she who scratches, and she was a regional lioness goddess similar to Sekhmet who kind of popped up around the Middle Kingdom. We also have Mut, who is the primordial mother goddess of ancient Egypt from their creation myth, and she would sometimes be portrayed as a cat or have a cat with her. And then last we have Muti, who is referred to in two different books of the dead, the Book of the Gates and the Book of the Caverns. And he is a, depicted as a guardian of the 11th division of the Jua, and also as watching over the enemies of Ra. Cats were also an integral part of Egyptian normal life and household. The Egyptian word for cat was mau or mute, which we're pretty sure is just an onomatopoeic reference to their meow. Some people were even named after cats. The pharaoh Pami, his tr name translates to to Tomcat or he who belongs to the cat in reference to Bastet. Little girls were often named Muti after female cats, showing their fondness for cats and children. In tomb paintings, we can see a transition from mostly outdoor cats to indoor cats as well throughout time. They start off as being depicted in a lot of hunting scenes following their masters and participating in like usually I think like bird and waterfowl hunts and then gradually you see them start to be depicted more in indoor scenes usually in domestic settings. For example you would see them depicted under the chair or near the chair of a wife uh, probably in reference again to this aspect of fertility. Now even though the Egyptians had a, a, obviously like a name or four cats, uh, they didn't tend to actually individually name their pet cats, which is kind of strange when you think about the fact that they actually did do this for their dogs. The first recorded name that we actually have for a cat is Nedjem, which when translated means sweetie, sweet one, or pleasant. References to Nedjem was found in the tomb of the nobleman Pwimre, don't think I'm saying that right, from the reign of Tutmos III in the New Kingdom. Around 100 years later, after we have this reference of uh, Nedjem, Prince Tutmos, who's the son of Pharaoh Amenhotep III, buried his beloved pet cat in a beautifully carved limestone sarcophagus. Her name was Tamu, which means she cat or female cat. On her sarcophagus, she's depicted in a similar way that we would expect for a, an esteemed nobleman, including having a sacrificial table filled with meat and other food. The sarcophagus inscription reads, I myself am placed among the imperishable ones that are in the sky, for I am Tamu the triumphant. This and other tomb scenes confirm the cat's lofty status in the household as they are sometimes shown being dressed in gold and eating off of their owner's plates. Emma's not allowed to do that, unfortunately for her. All cats were considered to be under the guardianship of Pharaoh, and there were extremely heavy penalties for harming a cat throughout the history of ancient Egypt. Killing a cat, even accidentally, was punishable with the death penalty, as a unfortunate Roman citizen found out when he accidentally killed a cat, and the king wasn't even able to intervene and, you know, try to kind of claim ignorance, and, and he was put to death. It was also apparently illegal to export cats to neighboring countries, which obviously then led to a thriving trade of a black market of cats. We do have court records of armies getting sent out every once in a while to go and rescue these kidnapped cats and bring them back home to Egypt. According to the famous Greek historian Herodotus and another historian known as Diodorus, whenever the family cat died, an Egyptian family would officially mourn them by shaving off all of their eyebrows. The family would also probably take their cat to Bubastis or a temple of Bas. They would then be embalmed and buried in sacred repositories along with the standard provisions for a cat's afterlife like milk, mice, and rats. <laughs> However, while it's very obvious that the Egyptians 
loved their personal cats. There is a more sinister side to things that I think doesn't really get talked about a lot. While unsanctioned killing or harming of a cat by a member of the public was obviously prohibited, at the temples of Bast there was clearly an exception in that they practiced ritual sacrifice of cats and kittens in quite large quantities. These temples would have with them large catteries for the purpose of breeding cats for these sacrifices. Um, people would come to either have a cat sacrificed as a votive offering to Bastet, or sometimes they would get them killed for the purpose of being buried with the cat as well. Interestingly, this practice was most popular during kind of like the later part of Egyptian history during I think the late period and then the Hellenistic Ptolemaic Kingdom. The mummified cats were most often buried in Bubastis, other cat cemeteries in other places like Giza, Abydos, Dendera, and Beni Hassan. The ancient Egyptians love for their cats was very well known even in the ancient world. In fact, there is actually an unverifiable, I guess, story or legend that when the Persian king Cambyses II was invading Egypt, at a pity integral battle, his soldiers essentially rounded up a bunch of cats and other Egyptian sacred animals and let them loose onto the battlefield. Uh, the Egyptian soldiers who were so concerned for these animals essentially surrendered their weapons rather than inadvertently harming them, uh, leading to them losing the battle. As I said, we can't verify that this particular part of this battle actually happened, but shortly after this particular battle, the Persian king did end up conquering Egypt and officially putting an end to native rule of Egypt for quite a long time. After the arrival of Alexander the Great and then the Ptolemaic dynasty, Egypt rose to prominence once again, and the Ptolemies are known for the fact that even though they were Hellenistic or Greek, they followed a lot of the old traditions of Egypt and that included their reverence and worship of cats. The cult of Bastet actually reached its peak popularity under their rule. When I was looking for names, I did do some research into like famous historical cat names and I came across a claim that the famous Cleopatra VII had a favorite cat whose name was Tivoli, which I think is supposed to mean God's gift. But unfortunately, once I did a little bit more research into it, it turns out that this is not backed up by any empirical evidence that I could find on the internet which makes sense as Tivoli isn't exactly an Egyptian sounding name or a Greek sounding name. So it seems to be something that was made up and has just like propagated through the internet. There are no direct descendant breeds from those of ancient Egyptian cats. Obviously they were around for thousands of years and as trade and these things happened, they would have mixed with a lot of other different cat breeds but the kind of closest related to one that still exists in modern day is the rather appropriately named Egyptian Mao cat. I didn't really think about getting one of those, but they are quite like a short-haired cat, which you would kind of expect for one that's in Egypt where it's quite hot all the time, but they are pretty cute. All right, that's everything for today, guys. If you enjoyed this video and you learned something new, don't forget to give me a thumbs up. Are you going to name your cat after an Egyptian god or goddess such as Mauti or Bastet? Uh, let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe for more content and hit the bell to get notified when I put out new videos. I will be, I think, doing a separate video on Emma and why we picked her and our journey to getting a cat. For now, I will give you a little tidbit that while I found several Egyptian names that I liked, none of them really seemed to suit her because they're quite kind of harsh sounding names. My husband wasn't a big fan of any of them. And then at the end of the day, my name is Rachel, my husband's name is Ross. I thought it would be funny to name our cat Emma. If you get the joke, you get it. If not, go watch Friends. So that's all for me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed watching. It's been nice to uh, make a video for you again. And I hope you're all doing well. And uh, Emma and I will see you next time. Bye. Can you say bye? Bye-bye. Nah, she just wants to play.